is module one of three modules looking at how you can improve your floral art designs to be a prize winner. The first module here is how to prepare for any floral art competition regardless of the level of the competition. I will tell you that this particular module is about two hours long so either allow yourself that precious time to think about your floral art and improve your floral art or have a look at it in a few time chunks. Module 2 is about 30 minutes long and it covers all of the entries from the most recent world competition that was held in Barbados in June 2017. Module 3 is all about judges comments and what judges see as the most common mistakes that are made in competitions at all levels of floral art and there will also be some tips for you to look at your own designs and see how you can improve your own designs and that again will be about 30 minutes long. So let's get right into module one and I'll let you know a little bit about me first of all. For the last 10 years or so I've been competing in floral art competitions all around the world and each year I probably can put together a probably between 50 and 60 designs that I would use as competition designs as well as a lot of others that I'll do as preparation or practice or for demonstrations. So I've got a wealth of experience that I'm really pleased I'm able to share with you. I use both homegrown and commercially grown plant material and I do have a preference for homegrown material because what I like to do in floral art terms is go out and have a look at the plant material and that, let that help me determine what the design is going to be. Very much an organic designer rather than a structured designer I'd have to say. This module is going to cover eight ways to make your floral art competition design a prize winner. I'm going to look at the things that you can consider in your planning and preparation stages for a competition to give you a little bit of an edge over other competitors. There are things like knowing the show schedule, a very, very important part of how you make the decision about which competition you'll enter and which classes you will enter how you interpret the class titles, what's the best way to do your research, what areas can you gain inspiration from in terms of the class title. Choice of design styles. Now there are a lot of defined design styles in floral art around the world. Whether you use those or whether you work in a more contemporary fashion, we'll look at the, the pros and cons of all those different things. Choice of plant material. How do you get the plant, right plant material to tell the story of your particular design. The staging position for judging of your designs. Now when you first start out everyone does the same thing. We all think here is a design, I'll place it so that it faces the judges, front facing, flat facing on the bench and we'll look at the things you can do to adjust that slightly to give your design a little bit more visual depth or a little bit more height in different ways and use the space around your design as well as the design itself. Itself, I should say. The proportions of your design. An area where judges feel competitors still fall down, they get carried away with a particular design and they don't look at the proportions of the design in terms of the container or the staging that they've got. So it's an area where everyone can benefit from some improvement. Perfect mechanics. Uh, I have to say that in my local competition area there is a competitor whose work is almost, always absolutely technically perfect. And we all aspire to being as good as that and it is important because when you come down to perhaps one or two designs that are, are equally as good in all other aspects the thing the judges will look at is how well finished off is that design so your mechanics need to be perfect you need to be good at the mechanics and it also helps to keep balance and stability in your designs in a physical sense and the plant material condition, another area where there will be a difference between your design and maybe someone else's if your plant material is not absolutely perfect and that's why we all get very stressed at big competition time where we don't know the plant supplies and we can't choose the plant material ourselves, it's pre-ordered plant material and we worry about whether it's going to be in perfect condition because we know that that can sometimes mean the difference between a championship and a, and a second or third placing. Just before we do start though, I want to talk about being a bit more structured about your design planning. And so we'll look at 
what sort of things you can do to record this exercise of planning your design. You can use a notebook if you're liking. I started out using books and I still to this day use books. I've used paper systems like single sheet systems. I've used electronic digital records as well and I find that the book for me is the best way and I've got a couple of volumes now of books that I refer back to. I just have to make sure I remember which year it was that I did that particular design but it's always good to, to look back through the designs and to see your own development and to see the improvement that you've made and to see the things that you've changed and the things that you've learnt along the way and the things that the judges are saying because if you find that the judges are saying the same thing year in year out about your designs it might be something that you really need to focus on. You can review similar titles from your previous competitions and look at how you interpreted that design, what sort of results you got from it, what problems you had with it, what worked well with it, what you would have changed had you had the opportunity to redo it. It's useful for interpreting the class title, the design style and the plant material use. So the three areas that will help you determine whether you really should be entering a particular class. Do you like the title? Does it mean something to you? Does it engender an idea of a design style so if you had something that was a an abstract design you know is there something that in the class title that makes it feel like it should be abstract and does that then give you an indication of the plant material and if not perhaps there's something in the designs that you've done back over the years that might help you in that interpretation help you make that decision about whether this is the competition or the class for you to enter Let's get started then on the real work. So first of all, getting to know the show schedule, really reading it and understanding it and letting it help you make the decision about whether you should enter a particular competition or not. So first of all, obviously, you've got to get a copy of the current schedule. You need to get, I think, copies of previous schedules and this gives you an indication of whether these titles have been used previously, what sort of other rules might be in place previously that perhaps have changed or have been added to in, in these years. You need to read through those competition rules. Then you need to read through the show rules, as well, show rules as well. Now the competition rules are the rules on which the judging is based. So they'll be very static. For most competitions they don't change and they don't change between national, state and, and international competitions. They're, they're about six that you see will appear in every competition that you enter. The show rules on the other hand are the rules that are particular to that particular show or that particular location. So they are additional to the competition rules and you will see them presented in different ways and you need to read through both. You need to understand both so that you know what constraints there are, what limitations there are and also what's allowed in this particular competition. You need to know the judging criteria so you need to know on what rules the judging will be based. So whether it's World Association or your Country Association or local show rules or Garden Club rules. You need to review the classes that you've shortlisted to enter and read, look at those classes in terms of your competition rules and your show rules and the judging criteria and make sure that they're really the ones that are going to give you the best opportunity to show your particular skills. And then obviously you need to submit it by the due date. Now I put that in because I need to remind you that some competitions close very much earlier than the competition date itself. So it, for instance if you're looking at a world show it's almost a year before the competition that you actually have to get your nomination for entries in. So for if you're looking at stepping up to do international competitions you need to be aware of the lead times for those competitions and start to get yourself organized really early. It does give you a lot of time to plan and to prepare and we'll hear in module three from one of the special prize winners at the World Show who did take that full 12 months to develop her design and it showed in the end she got a special prize. So getting a copy of the current schedule first of all. Let's look at what a schedule is. A schedule can be called either a show schedule or a competition schedule and it's drawn up by the competition organisers to set out the details required by both judges and competitors and that includes the classes, the titles of the classes, the staging of those classes, so whether it's on a plinth or a cube or the bench or it's a hanging design, all those sorts of things that are related to staging of the, the designs. 
eligibility to enter. Now it might be that a competition has both open classes where anyone can enter. They might have novice classes where only where they're restricted to a certain group of people who perhaps have not won a prize at that show, show or at any show. Previously, uh, the awards that are going to be given out, the rules as we've talked about previously, the general information about the show, and that'll be things like the, the time of staging, the time for collection of designs, and whether you need car passes, if you can park, all those sorts of things, the restrictions on designs, and that might be things that can't be used in the design, or restrictions in terms of access to the designs after they've been judged, all those sorts of things. Exhibitors, both competitors and exhibitors, are judges are bound by the schedules requirements. So they are the rules by which the competition is run. So here, let's have a look at an example now. This is from the World Flower Show in Barbados, and the title of the class was Archipelago. The staging width was 91 centimeters, the depth was 76 centimeters, and the height was optional. The staging itself, the, the mechanics of staging, is a two staggered metal frames containing mesh fixed to a pole on a base. Now the frame width is 31 centimetres, the height 66 centimetres, the lower frame is 45 centimetres from the floor and the upper frame is 111 centimetres from the floor. The mesh is made up of 5 centimetre squares, the pole height is 179 centimetres and there you can see the base width is 30 by 30 and it's 1.5 centimetres from the floor. Now the, the idea of telling us the height from the floor is that if you wanted to have something hanging down, because the height's optional, you don't actually have to be limited to the frames themselves. You can go above and below the frames, but you wouldn't want to go below the height from the floor. You wouldn't want your design touching the floor because there's an opportunity for you to lose marks if the judges feel that your material is being supported by the floor. So you don't want to go beyond that. So if you were looking at using the, a particular height, you would be bringing it down to, to above that 1.5 centimetres above the floor. The other thing to look at in terms of the height is, is that the, the, um, the depth of the design, this is a flat mesh frame, but you've got 76 centimetres of depth that you can use. So you'd have to think about how you could hang something through the, the mesh perhaps to give you the depth of the design. And it's going to be judged from the front, which is always a good thing. <laughs> so there's a, a finished design on the staging. And it shows you that the actual, the height of this design was extended below the bottom frame, but not so much above the top frame. And it came out into the space between the two frames as well. Schedules can be obtained by emailing, downloading from a website, telephoning the show organisers or writing to the listed show chairman or, or show secretary or the organisation hosting the competition. Increasingly I see them as being able to be downloaded from a website. You can also request a schedule prior to its release by putting your name on a mailing list with some organisations. So we have the instance with a local show here where people will come through, see the designs at, at the show one year and think that that would be a good thing for them to do. We take their names and addresses and when the schedule is ready for the following year we'll send it out to them and encourage them to enter because we don't see them between one show and the next so that's our way of promoting the show. If you do request a, a schedule be mailed out to you and you haven't received it after about seven days from your contact I do recommend that you follow up because you need as much time as possible to have a look at that schedule to dis determine whether you're going to enter a competition or not. So now, we'll go on to getting copies of previous schedules. Why do I think this is important? Sometimes it's useful to read the previous schedules to get some understanding of how classes might have been interpreted in the past with different design styles or staging sizes. So, for instance, if we had something that was called a country garden. Now, one year it might be scheduled as a naturalistic design and that means that as far as possible the material in the design is placed to represent its natural habitat and its natural habit of growth. The following year we might see it entered as a landscape design. Now a landscape design 
is different in that it prov provides a larger dimensional view. So trees, bushes, flowers and soil are represented in the design, but they don't have to be shown in their natural habit of growth. So we, and perhaps there is no, it might be that one year there was no design style nominated, so you could do it in either of those design styles. So it would be interesting comparison to look back at the schedules and to look back at the websites or the results of the show and see how they were these designs were interpreted in a particular way. Previous schedules can usually be obtained from the organisation directly. Obviously they'll have records because they keep their history in their archives and sometimes they'll be on their websites with photos of the entries and the results and that's a really good resource for researching whether you think this is an appropriate class or a class title for you to work on. Thirdly, we need to read through the competition rules. Now your schedule should cover the following, and this is where I talked about competition rules being very much standard across the board in all floral art competitions everywhere in the world. An exhibit's made of plant material with or without accessories within a space specified. Plant material must predominate over all other components of the exhibit, and I think you'll find that in every schedule everywhere. Fresh plant material must be in water or water retaining material unless it remains turgid for the full duration of the show. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the word turgid, it simply means that they will remain hydrated, that they won't dry out, they won't die off if they are out of water for the duration of the show and that can be things like orchids, um, succulents, a, a number of, of um, plants can remain out of water depending on the duration of the show and so they would be allowed to not be in a water or water retaining source. The competition rules should tell you how the competition will be judged so that's whether it's under world association rules, under local country rules or local garden club or, or local show rules in fact. It should tell you whether the exhibits may be done by one or more person whether the pre-constructed work may be used, whether artificial colouring will be allowed to be used, and that will also often say the percentage of those two, both pre-constructed and artificial colouring, it'll talk about a percentage of that that can be used in your designs. The plant material need not have been grown by the exhibitor. Sometimes we see this more so in local shows where they might have a section for designs where all of the components have been grown by the exhibitor and then there'll be another section where they don't have to have been grown by the exhibitor. And another one that we see pretty much in every schedule is that no artificial plant material may be used. It should also tell you if additional drapes, bases may or may not be used. Now, now this is one that we'll, you probably wouldn't see so much in the competition rules as you might see in the individual class descriptions and it will tell you whether you can use your own drapes whether you have to supply your own base or not. And we'll look at that in some of the examples of the ones that we see. So for the World Flower Show, these are the World Association of Flower Arrangers International Show Rules. So these are the ones that cover every international show that is where they use the World Association judging criteria. An exhibit is made of plant material with or without accessories within the space specified in the show schedule. So they're saying that you need to look at the show schedule in addition to these rules to understand exactly what is required. Plant material must predominate over all other components of the exhibit. The use of artificial plant material is forbidden unless otherwise stated in the schedule. Fresh plant material must be in water or in a water retaining medium unless such material remains turgid throughout the judging and must be maintained throughout the event. So this is a slightly different to the, the ones that we talked about just a, a minute or so ago in that the fresh plant material has to remain turgid throughout the judging. So in terms of a world show you have five or six hours to put your design together and then it is judged that, that in the following three or four hours. So if you were to put your exhibit together really early and you knew that your plant material would stay fresh and didn't need water for say 10 or 12 hours then you, you've probably got a bigger range of material that you can use but it, you do have to maintain your design throughout the event so these world shows are on 
are open to the public for four days after judging for 12 hours a day and you have a, a maintenance period before it opens to the public and that would mean that you would have to be prepared to go in every morning and maintain your exhibit so change the flowers over freshen them up or put them in water or or um, refresh them in some way painted and or artificially colored plant material may be used unless otherwise stated in the schedule and pre-prepared work must not predominate in the exhibit so you can do some beforehand but it can't be more and i would would look at that and say it's probably they wouldn't like to see it being more than about 20%, 25% of the design that was obviously pre-prepared beforehand. <clears throat> if we look then at the staging regulations, which then become the local rules for this particular competition in Barbados, you can see that there was a page and a half of them. I've got to read through them, but, but you can hold the video and look at them at your leisure if you're interested in them. It does tell you exactly what needs to be done all sorts of different types of classes um, and they are very specific to this particular competition as you'll see second page of those page and a half of those and talks about the maintenance period and the dismantling all of the things that you need to know in terms of making a decision about whether you would enter this competition or not in addition to that in Barbados there was some extra information about, about because it, it, obviously there's the opportunity for you to bring in your own plant material from other countries. So there's information on what you had to do to ensure that you were allowed to bring in that information. You got the approvals from the Department of Agriculture, both in your own country and in Barbados. But also there's a definition there. And this is a very interesting one because there were a number of classes where uh, foliage was needed to be used. And their concern was that the definition of foliage in terms of floral art is not necessarily botanically correct, but for the purposes of the competition, this is what they will accept as foliage for design work. And so it was important in terms of the, the variety of countries, there's 31 countries that attend a World Flower Show, so they might all have different ideas of what foliage actually means in their internal competition. So for a world competition, put out the definition, tell the competitors exactly what they will consider as foliage so it's clear what they can use in their design. So again, a reason for you to read these schedules really carefully so you understand exactly what can and what can't be used in a competition. And it makes a difference to whether you want to enter a particular class or not. I would think you would want to take that into consideration. So every schedule should have a list of local competition rules or staging regulations. If you have a question, ask the so the, the if you have a question, ask the show secretary before you decide to enter a competition. It's really important for you to get all of the information on which to base your decision before you decide to enter a competition. Check the staging and collection times. Make sure that's going to fit in with the constraints that you might have in terms of travel or accessibility to a competition venue. The schedule should tell you what colour the staging drapes are, the floor, the walls, etc. And particularly in larger competitions because you want to be able to put your design on display so that it stands out from the staging or it incorporates the staging. I know in, in our local competitions we like to know exactly what colour the paint is on some of them so that some of our bases we will, we will paint the same colour as the staging so that they disappear into the staging and the design itself just seems to float freely above the staging. Other times we, and I did this with the World Flower Show, I want to know what colour the staging is because I want to incorporate that colour into the design so that the design seems to blend in with the staging and bring the, the staging into the design itself so it becomes organically joined to it in that sense. So here's one in fact where I asked a little bit more about the staging because some of the colours were given but not all of the colours were given. So this, the title was in high spirits, the diameter 76 centimetres, height was optional and the staging was a rum barrel, a very unusual staging and not one that I'd, I'd come across before with six metal straps. So my question to them 
was that the rum bar barrel was obviously a dark brown colour. What colour were the metal straps? And that came back to say that they were also a dark brown, which was good because it meant that I didn't have to incorporate perhaps another metallic colour, which is difficult to do in, in a floral design. The diameter at the base and the top was 56 centimetres, so, but you'll see that we were allowed to use 76 centimetres, so we could actually come out away from the top of the barrel and use the space above the barrel as part of our design, but only 20 centimetres, so not a whole lot wider than the top of the barrel could we go. The largest circumference of the the barrel was 202 centimetres, so obviously that, that sort of barrel shape and it was going to be judged all around. So it had to be interesting from every angle when you walked around the design. And there's my offering at the World Flower Show. And you can see in that, that I've actually incorporated the brown into the base of the design and those uh, little paper circles came through the design on the other side. You can't see it on this side, but it came through on the other side. So it came up into the design. So it looked like the, it was flowing out of the design and down into the barrel, which is what I, the effect I wanted to, to get. Knowing the judging criteria. So this is the judging rules under which the competition is being conducted. So whether it's the World Association, local country associations, garden clubs, your, your local group that you might have some judging rules put together for, you need to know what they are and you need to know also that they're different. It really, I can't stress enough that it's vitally important for you to get copies of these handbooks or these judging rules so that you know exactly what the judges are going to use to assess the designs that are placed before them. If we look at perhaps an example of the petite class. So petite, you would think it's a defined design style Every country has a definition of what it is. And if you didn't check to see what that was, so say for the World Flower Show, there was a class that was a petite design. So had I not checked to see what that meant in terms of the judging criteria, I would have been caught out. Because in this country, a petite design is over 10 centimetres and less than 23 centimetres. Height, width and depth. So you, you have a little cube that you put over your design to make sure it fits into that, that actual space. All components, the container, the plant material and the base must be in scale with one another and within this size limitation. However, at the World Show, the width was 30.5, the depth was 30.5 and the height was 30.5. So significantly different and had I put in an entry into the under the World Association judging rules, thinking that it was the same as the local rules, it would have been too small because all of the other designs would have been seven centimetres bigger in every direction. And so I would have lost marks in terms of the use of the space and use of the staging. If we look at another country that has a big representation in, at the world level, look at their definition of a petite design style it's an exhibit not exceeding 25 centimeters in width and depth and the height can be stated but has to be in good proportion so it can be any of these sizes again they probably would have had a better chance because they would have thought well 25 means that it should be 37 so they would have gone over in height um, but they would have been okay in all of the other dimensions. So again, a, a good reason to be very clear about what the schedule says in terms of the design style and then look at the judging criteria so that you know that what it says in the schedule is reflected in the way it's going to be judged. I know that it might seem like just a couple of centimetres, but I can assure you that the first thing that stewards do in any competition before the judges even walk into the room is go around and measure the exhibits and mark any that are out of size, regardless of whether it's a design style or not. So they'll just look at the schedule and see what space you've been allocated. If you're outside of that for any reason, you'll be marked as NAS, which is not according to schedule. And it is the fastest and easiest way to be disqualified.
to have your design not judged, even though it might be left on the bench for display. From the show rules, you should know which judging criteria will be used. So if it's not stated in the schedule, then you need to ask the organisers because you need to get a copy of that relevant criteria for the classes you're thinking about, particularly if it's a design style like the petite or perhaps a miniature, an abstract, a modern mass, a pedestal, a niche, any of those design styles that are defined so that your understanding of the definition perhaps from your local experience is the same as this particular competition. Now we're up to selecting the classes to enter. So how many should you try? Yeah, I reckon you should do as many as you can. But sometimes you're only allowed to enter one. So make sure it's the one that's going to be able to display your skills and your interpretation in the best possible light. Be honest about the time it'll take you to put your design together on competition day. And that relates more to if you decide you're going to enter more than one class. Sometimes, I will admit, it helps with the nerves or makes a special trip worthwhile to have a couple of designs to complete. Now in this year's World Show, normally in a World Show you are only allowed to enter one class and you, you, when you nominate you, you choose three and then they allocate you on the basis of, I think sometimes just a lucky dip of which one you'll get. And this year, fortunately for me, we were allowed to enter more than one and so I entered two classes, I jumped at the chance because going from here to Barbados is you know, 50 odd hours of travel, so I might as well throw myself into it completely and utterly and I really enjoyed the opportunity but what I did have to do I knew I didn't get any extra time the staging time for designs was five hours so I had two and a half hours for each design to put together so I had to be really strict with myself about being prepared beforehand and knowing exactly the routine I was going to follow to put the designs together at the time and not have a lot of stuff that needed intricate work while it was being staged. Naturally enough, in this country we have a saying and, the, and uh, that's about having a go. So I think that the first step for you is to have a go, is to enter something, is to give it a try. Go through all of these things that I'll talk to you about in the next couple of hours and it will give you a good grounding. If you haven't entered a competition before, there's no time like the present to start. If you haven't entered a competition outside of your area, try somewhere else. Test yourself, see how good you really are, but use all of this as the basis to help you make that transition. Choose the classes to enter where you had a reaction to the title. So obviously when you're looking through the schedule, you will read them and you'll think, oh, I like the sound of that one, or I'd like to try that particular design style. Do those ones because you are already, the creative juices are flowing and you're thinking in terms, of, even it might be in the back of your brain, you're thinking about that particular design or design style and you're already excited. So let that momentum carry you through. Choose classes with your favoured design styles. Now, over the years, I have developed a, much more of a, a liking for modern and contemporary designs as opposed to traditional designs. And that's a lot of it's to do with the fact that the traditional designs use a lot of flowers in a very formal and structured way. And I'm much more, as I said at the beginning, an organic person. And I like to look, walk in nature and see the different shapes and the odd shapes and think, well, that reminds me of this. It's a bit like lying on your back and looking at clouds. You know, you see things in the clouds. Well, I see thing in, things in plants. And so I like the modern styles because they're a minimum amount of plant material for maximum impact and the contemporary stuff to a lesser extent because you can do a bit of manipulation and changing things around. Check the sizes of the classes. So you don't want to attempt anything that's a bit too big, but you do want to keep stretching yourself. So I would suggest that you try different types of staging style so this time around for the world show I tried that the one on the rum barrel I've never done anything like that before I've done some some a lot of competition pieces that are judged all around but they're always on the square plinth so this time it was a little bit different to work in that circular motion and to have to think about a circular design as well work out the staging timings as I said so and only enter the number of classes that you can comfortably stage in the time that's allocated for putting your designs together. It's a little bit different if you're allowed to actually bring things in 
prepared and ready for staging because then you you have a bit more time at home that you can put them together but then the, the flip side to that is that you actually have to transport them ready to the competition venue and I've never had any success with that I'm much more comfortable actually putting them together where I'm at the competition venue list the classes that you've shortlisted for out of the schedule for consideration in terms of this competition and review them again in terms of all of the stuff that we've talked about up to this point and then there might be some that are impose or imposed classes. Now these are the classes where everything is handed to you and you have the same material as everybody else in the class and you have a set amount of time and they'll give you a topic. Sometimes they give it to you beforehand and you have to put something together. And I actually like these. I, I think they're the kind of design that you start to get to like after you've had a bit of experience under your belt and you want to test yourself about thinking on the spot. There are others I know in, in my competition group who, who can't stand them, who see that they're a waste of time, but I actually am beginning to really enjoy them. First of all, you need to check the staging that's going to be used. So whether it's going to be on a bench or on a, a round base, or perhaps it's a, a bigger impose and so it's going to be on a stand look at that and, and be comfortable that you can work in that kind of space. Check the rules for permitted tools. Now there will always be a list of tools that you can take into an impose class. You can't take everything, you can't take your big bag with all of your bits and pieces, the just in case scenarios. Oftentimes you can only take your cutters, sometimes you can take wires as well but only the um, support wires not decorative wires. So have a look and see if you can work with just the tools that you're going to be allowed to work with in this particular class. Check the rules for the supplied material. So this is about how much of the material that they give you are you expected to use. For the most part it will be 70 to 80 percent and they will, the stewards will come around and check to see how much has been left over and they will mark it down on your judging sheet for the judges. Research the title if this is supplied. It's not always supplied for an impose class, but if it is supplied, then I would suggest that you start thinking about that title and about what you could do, how you could interpret it, without knowing what material you're going to get. Still have a basic understanding of what the title means to you. And be prepared for on-the-spot changes. So sometimes it happens that the best of organisers don't get what they want in terms of supplies and this was the case most recently for the World Flower Show. One of the impose classes, there were three impose classes and one of them because of a tropical storm they couldn't get the plant material that they were expecting to have and so the competitors who did know the title beforehand were all expecting a certain colour of plant material. That didn't come a different colour came all together and I know that some of them were a bit perplexed about how they could use this colour to depict the title and what they would thought about beforehand. So you need to be a bit flexible, you need to be able to think on your feet, but sometimes that's a really good challenge in terms of our floral art. When we, we get a bit tired of, or we get a bit stuck for ideas in terms of thinking beforehand about a design, test yourself with an impose and reignite that creative juice that you think you might have lost. So let's have a look at an example of an impose. Now this is one of the bigger ones. This is two meters by two meters. We didn't know the title beforehand. Um, normally, as I said, the impose would be on a bench or on a plinth, but this particular competition, they use the mesh stands. So the title was only given to us 15 minutes before the start of the competition, and we had three hours to complete the design. The title that we were given was that it had to be a display for the foyer of an opening for an art gallery and we only had Australian native plant material to use 80% of the material that they supplied had to be used and the stewards came around at the end of the time and looked at what was left on your bench and marked down on against your competitor number um, how much had been left over percentage of material that was still left over to be used now I used probably I probably used about 70% of my material. I ran out of time. I didn't manage my time well. There was still material that I wanted to use as a reflection of that top display on the bottom of the base. So you can, to, you know, to me, looking at it now, it looks very empty at the bottom because I know that I was going to put something else at the bottom and I had that material left over. So I would have lost marks for the fact that I hadn't used 80% of my material and that there is a big 
space at the bottom of the design <laughs> even though the top looks pretty good I reckon we were permitted to move the screen so sometimes you can't move the staging you can't change the way it is to be presented for judging on this occasion we were allowed to and because I wanted to use the, the screen as part of the depth of the design I wanted it at an angle so that the judge could see side on that there was some depth to the design through the screen as well the toolkits, as I said, were checked prior to staging to ensure that we only had, we were allowed cutters and glue and a knife, and that was it. This is another example. This was an interesting competition, an international competition, and it was a two-part competition. So the first part of our entries were designs that we could prepare uh, and think about beforehand and actually we had two hours to complete the staging once we were there at the, the competition venue then we had a 15 minute break in that time we were given our instructions about the impose which was the second part of our entry we were given the plate the black bit at the bottom and that was for the staging of the impose and also as the water source for the impose we had an hour to complete the design there was no limit on the amount of plant material that we had to use from what was supplied but we did have to use a roll of wire, flat wire, that had been supplied to us and that had to be completely used in a creative way with our instructions. And we, what we had to put together was a hand-tied freestanding bouquet. And so the, the container that the plate was supplied was the water source and it had to showcase the bouquet so we had, it had to be standing in that. Well, I felt it had to be standing in it. Some people had it lying down in it, but freestanding, and to me, it had to be standing up on its own. Lastly, we need to submit our entries by the due date. And as I said earlier, you need to check the schedule to see when the entries close. Sometimes it can be well and truly ahead of the actual competition day. So for World Shows, it's about 10 months before the actual competition itself. Keep a record of your submitted entry and the date it was sent so that you can follow through if you don't get confirmation of your entry. Follow the schedule instructions for entering the competition and paying the entry fee by the required time of registration. One of the most important things is to ensure from the time that you put your entry in to the time of the competition you make sure that your contact information is kept up to date so that anyone in the show organising committee can get in touch with you in case there are changes to schedules or staging or judging times. Now, it might be that they get not enough entries in a particular class and so they're not going to have that class and they'll need to move you to another class or need you to think about another class or they might change the staging of that particular class to another day or they might change the judging times for whatever reason. I know we had a competition here where royalty was coming and they had to change the judging time so that the security people could come through when our judging would normally happen and so they had to let us know that the day before and it was very important because we only have a set period of time to get these designs ready before judging and it was cutting two hours off our preparation time so we all needed to know that and needed to know it pretty quickly. So in summary in terms of the schedules get a copy of the current schedule get copies of previous schedules, read through the competition rules, read through the show rules, look for things like prohibited plant material. There might be restrictions on the type of plant material you're allowed based on perhaps their noxious classification or simply because they are too perfumed for the area in which they're going to be displayed. I do a competition each year in a church and the displays stay in place during the services on a Sunday and if there were 50 odd displays all with very heavily perfumed flowers in them then the poor old congregation would be pretty suffering by the end of the service time so they restrict the entries to nothing that ha is perfumed at all they just can't take the risk of you know even if 50 designs had one that was strongly perfumed it would still be overpowering for the poor congregation the other side to that is the noxious classifications which we're seeing increasingly in competitions is is plant material that is considered a pest or a weed in certain areas and can't be used and that was the case in Barbados as well as it is locally here. 
The drop-off and collection times, another thing to have a look at in, in the schedule to check to see when you can drop off or start your design as well as when you can collect it after the show. Now this is an area where I'm very particular about people leaving their designs on display for the duration of the show. It is simply not fair to the organisers, to the general public, to other competitors if you want to be a special case and go in and take your design home early because it suits you to do so. The schedule is put together with your collection times. You should stick to those, otherwise you shouldn't enter the competition. I'm sorry, I'm just very strict about that. <laughs> Vehicle access for unloading. Be familiar with where you are permitted to unload your design. It might be a long way away from where the actual designs are going to be staged, so you might need a trolley or they might have trolleys available. Parking permits, vehicle entry permits for some venues. Um, I know with the World Show previously in Dublin, we needed vehicle permits to drop off and there were only a limited number of permits that were given out. So if you didn't get one, it meant you were carrying all of your design material probably a block and a half to the venue because you couldn't get in, you couldn't get a car any closer than that unless you had the passes. Think of how many other people will be trying to do the same thing at the same time. So in terms of a world flower show, you know, it's between 500 and 600 competitors all trying to get to the same place at the same time and unload their cars at the same time point in the venue's parking lot or surrounding areas. So think about those sorts of logistics as well. You need to know the judging criteria. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, the judging times and feedback is another thing to look for in the schedule itself. So that it should say either that they will provide you with written comments, the judges, or that there is a time where you can meet with the judges for general feedback over all of the designs and then there might also be the opportunity for specific feedback about your design. In all cases, judges will not give you feedback specifically on someone else's design. That's simply not fair. You wouldn't want it to happen to yours. You wouldn't want someone else to be asking about your design and get feedback about your design. So they don't do it. They just don't ask them about it. They'll give you general feedback about all designs based on the principles and elements of design and the way they've judged, but they won't give you specific comments unless it is your own design. Remember about pre-prepared work. Sometimes you're allowed to do pre-prepared work before the competition day, but it mustn't predominate in your design or you'll lose marks unless you are permitted to bring your design in ready for staging and this will be stated in the schedule it will say it might be a mailing class or it might just say simply designs are permitted to be brought in ready for staging in that case you can do it all at home if you can safely transport it which i can't so i don't do that our summary select the classes to enter submit it by the due date look at the grading of the competition perhaps I think I did talk about it a little bit earlier that some competitions will have defined levels of, and that might be that open is for anyone of any level to enter those particular classes. Novice is for people who haven't won a show prize at a particular show and then there might be, particularly if it's a garden club type of competition, there will be levels. So A, B, C and D is most commonly used and that is a grading that means that you are competing against people with similar skills and you if you win at x number at a certain level then you move up to the next level or you are assessed as ready for the next level in terms of the judging criteria some competitions also allow for a professional and an amateur grade and that's more so in the international competitions but queries about grading levels for a competition if you see them in a schedule should always be directed to the show secretary or the show chairman so you get clarification on those. It's important to read the complete schedule to find out restrictions on things like the size of the exhibits, pre-prepared work, prohibited plant material, drop-off and collection times, vehicle access for unloading, judging times and feedback, closing date for entries and any fees and the grading of the competition. If you have questions about any of these things that you don't feel is covered in the schedule, ask the show secretary. That's what they're there for. 
Let's quickly have a look at one more example in terms of the schedule. This was an interesting schedule. The title was Colourful Creations. The space allowed was one metre by one metre with 1.9 metres being the maximum height. Viewed and judged from both the front and the sides and it was a concrete floor with a natural hessian backing and you had to supply your own baseboard if you chose to do so. Now I didn't choose to do so on this occasion. I used a, a stub of a tree as the stand so I didn't need that it went straight onto the concrete floor. But again in terms of thinking about the design I wanted it because it had the, the hessian backing. I knew that I needed something that would pop out away from the hessian backing but still had the colours of the hessian backing so that it it blended in with that backing and with the concrete floor which wasn't going to give me, you know, it's a grey so it's achromatic so you can use pretty well anything against it to make the colours pop out. Step two class title interpretation. So this is where do we get inspiration and how do we look at a class title and decide what we're going to do. My biggest suggestion is to do your research but keep the competition in mind. The judges might not understand certain interpretations because of language or culture differences. Now this is brought home to me quite often because we have quite a range of judges in this country and I will have colloquial Australian reaction to some particular class titles and if I go overseas and have that same reaction well I'm, it's just not going to work because they don't have the same thought process they don't have the same background as I've got and so they will think in a different way so all the way through this I'm going to talk about keeping it simple write down your immediate reaction for a particular class title then use the dictionary the encyclopedia music poetry art anything else that that gives you a background to what the title is talking to you about. Talk to your family and friends about the title, give them the title, see what their reaction is, see if you can work that through in a design in some way. Don't presume that the, that the judges will follow your thought pattern and don't be too obscure. So don't think of some esoteric meaning of life to a particular class title because you really want the judges to be able to look at your design and their reaction to be what the class title is. Take note of all the words in the class title ensuring that your design reflects all of them. So if it says for example rough with the smooth that you don't just do rough or you don't just do smooth and one tiny bit of rough. You should, if it's got things like that they should be equally represented in a design. Competition work is the combination of design style and class title interpretation. So we've got the, we've talked about the, the interpretation of the class title. You also need to look at the design style. So a class title might conjure up ideas of a particular design style. So say that the class title was modern art. Then my immediate reaction to that would be that I need to do a modern design style, that a traditional design style like a, 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 a pedestal or a, a line design of some description is not going to fit into the title of modern art. It might for you but it doesn't for me. When it's classed as an interpretive design you'll be allowed more freedom to tell the story of that class title with your plant material. But if it doesn't mention interpretive you need to be mindful of the reality of the class title and the appropriate design style. Now I'll, I'll show you an example of what I mean because that's a little bit hard to get your head around. So say our title was incorporating a musical instrument. Now it doesn't say interpretive, it just says incorporating a musical instrument. And whenever you see incorporating and something after it, so sometimes you'll see incorporating a figurine, you would obviously use a real figurine. And the issue here is the same, incorporating a musical instrument. So it has to be a real musical instrument because it doesn't say that it's an interpretive design. So if we look at the first example here, beautiful design, very interpretive. We've got a drum made out of bark and moss and the drumsticks are seed pods and little other what we could probably construe as musical instruments made out of seed pods and, and nuts and berries and things with some plant material, other plant material wrapped around it. Very interpretive, very evocative of, of music. 
but there's no real actual musical instrument in it. So this design's interpretive because the musical instrument incorporated into the design, although made from plant material, does not include an actual instrument. On the other hand, this one that is a depiction of bagpipes, we can see that at the base of this design there is what's called a chanter, which is the bottom part of actual bagpipes, and because that has been incorporated into the design where the rest of the design is made with the rest of the bagpipes are made with plant material, but we do have an in, a musical instrument because the chanter can be played on its own. It's, you, you use it as practice, a practice instrument for your bagpipes. So this one fills the bill in terms of the class title because it's not an interpretive design. It has included a real musical instrument in the design. Here's another example. And this, this one's interesting too because it actually specifies more than one design style. So the class title is that's different. So if we, if we just look at that first of all, what we want to see is that when the judge looks at this design, their first reaction is that's different. So they look at it and they go, oh, that's different. And I think you'd say that, that probably fits the bill, this one. But there's a proviso in it as well. It has to be an abstract design, so a particular design style, and it has to be a miniature design, so another design style. So two constraints on this design is that you need to plan an abstract design using the design style definitions for an abstract design, which is generally that the plant material is abstracted, so it's not used in a natural way, within the constraints of a miniature design, which is a sizing thing. So in this country, the sizing for this competition, the sizing was that it had to be less than 10 centimetres overall, so less than four inches overall. Your design, as I said, should tell the story to the judges so that for this class, their first reaction is that's different, which it was. So here's another example. And in this one, I'm going to actually talk about my design process, my thoughts as it, as it led up to actually putting the design together. So a bench design between the lines, 70 centimetres width, height unrestricted, judged from the front. My first reaction to this title was the phrase reading between the lines and its association with newspaper reporting and I thought that it could be incorporated the newspaper side of it could be incorporated into the container but how would I link that to the plant material so the design still needs to have clear lines with some plant material between these lines so that it it reflects the title of the class I could also use plant material that has lines, particularly foliage, or I could use a combination of all of those ideas. And it occurred to me after I had staged the design that some of the judges for this competition are not from an English-speaking background and they may not have heard the phrase reading between the lines. So the container would not enhance the design. And in fact, they might look at it and think, why is there newspaper around the base of this design? You know, where, what does that mean? Where does that come from? And so I might actually have lost marks because there might have been that lack of harmony between the container and the design in their eyes. So here is the design. The newspaper curried styrofoam as the container. Lines of slice bags here which is also lined in its flower composition, so it has lines that make up the flower, lines of spear grass, lines of Kyogi paper and foliage across the base, proteas and foliage both exhibiting lines placed between the lines of the banks here. And it came out really well. I was very happy with it in the end. But I still was worried about that container because as you can see, it's not reflected in the rest of the design. I haven't brought that that container through the, the newspaper through the design in any way. Fortunately for me, the judges actually understood what I was trying to do, and so it got a first. And here are the judges' comments. It was difficult to separate first and second, but this design had the added feature of including the container in the interpretation of the class title, so I was very fortunate because when you look at it, even though the container extends up into the design, so you could look at it and say, well, there is floral material, the bulk of the floral material is between those vertical lines of the newspaper covered styrofoam, but it doesn't really 
there's no other way of, of, of bringing that newspaper into the design, and so I could have lost marks for it on this occasion by being too clever. Now here's another example, rough with the smooth. A bench designed 70 centimetres in width, height unrestricted, judged from the front and the sides. So what I need to do with this one is have both rough and smooth plant material incorporated into the design. The do design needs to be interesting from each side as well as from the front because if it's being judged from the front and the sides then you need to have not just the side looking like it's a neat representation of, of what the front is, but to have something different at the sides that the judges see so that it's not quite an all round design, but it's a three quarter design. It, I thought it might be interesting to use just one type of plant material to show both rough and smooth features from a single plant. And I looked at that in terms of one of the Australian natives called a guy Mia Lily, the Dorianthes excelsa, large plant that has very rough looking flower and very smooth stalk and very smooth foliage. In, in fact when I was developing the design an alternative plant material I found that was the bangalow palm because on the one piece of the, the spathe it is smooth and rough one side to the other and I thought I could make that a feature because it's a beautiful colour that you'll see shortly. What I also needed was smooth textured but rough looking foliage for twisting around the spathe and then a feature for the back of the design that can be seen from the sides. So let's have a look at the design. There's the front of it and you can see that beautiful rich colour of the palm spathe on the inside, the smooth side and then from the side you can see how rough it is on the back of the spathe. I've got the green foliage which is very smooth but it's rough looking in it visually and I've got some rough bits of driftwood in the middle of it and some um, flowers wrapped in wire as well. Those features of, of the hanging features carry through to the, to the back of the design so the hanging out the, that side view obviously is very different to the front view and that's what I wanted in terms of the judges being able to look at it. Let's have a look at what the judges thought. A good strong interpretation using one piece of plant material to show both features of the class title. However, too many small out of proportion items detract from the initial impact of the design. And you can see that yourself when you look at the front you think it's a really good background but there's all these little busy bits, all these what they call the tizzy bits and, it's, and, it's, and it detracts from that beautiful coloured piece of spathe and what I should have had was a much bigger piece of driftwood perhaps at the bottom and just a little bit of the, of the green travelling through it. So this is why it's good to have this record of both the judges comments and the photos because you can look at their comments and look at your design and actually see what they're saying once the the pressure and the stretch of the competition is over. Another example, Ring a Ring of Roses. Now this is that to me, that statement is from a nursery rhyme. So it's staged on a cube, 60 centimeters square, and the space allowed is a meter square, and it's judged all around. So as I said, my first reaction was the nursery rhyme that ends with we all fall down. So I thought I'd have rings of roses with some of the roses fallen down at the base as though they were part of that particular nursery rhyme. I need to be mindful here of this using the space that's allocated because the staging area, the base of that cube is smaller than the actual space I'm allowed so I can actually go out beyond the base that is provided for us. For judging, an all around design needs to be interesting at any angle. So much the same as the ones that are judged from the front and the sides, this one needs to be interesting at every point of the compass that the judge might look at it and they will walk around and look at it from every angle. So what I needed to use was either a spiral or concentric circles of roses getting smaller to depict the spinning as you would with the nursery rhyme because that's what you do when you're singing the nursery rhyme. And circles for all of the shapes in the designs, rings of foliage, rings around the roses because I wanted to keep the finished design circular overall so that at every angle there's a view that keeps your eye moving in a circle so that you're continuously ringing around the roses in the design. Let's have a look at it. So there it is from a couple of different aspects. And the roses obviously in rings surrounded by rings of tortured willow in this case. 
There are some roses at the bottom that have fallen down from the rings. We'll see what the judges said. A neatly executed depiction of the class title showing rings on rings could have been improved with the use of the same colour roses for the base placements as in the rings above. And this is one of the cases where I ran out of material and what I should have done was not used the, as you can see, the yellow and the, the mauve coloured roses because they were different to everything else that was on it. So it didn't look like they'd fallen down. They just looked like they were out of place. But they were just these odd placements here and there. So it most definitely could have been improved with that. So what I needed to do was have more material that was the right colour or if I had run out, then to space them differently, perhaps spiral those ones on that base so that it looked like they were... I didn't need as many in the base to have it look like they would had fallen down as they were going round and round in the ring. So that's where I lost marks and was placed second for this particular design. So it's a good tip to remember to keep that harmony and rhythm consistent with your plant material. Now, using a display card in your design, if that'll enhance your design and the interpretation. And it's not about explaining your design, it's about categorising your design, sometimes because it will clarify your design interpretation and sometimes because you've actually been asked to put it there. But in all cases, you should use it sparingly because you really want to know that your plant material tells the story of the class title for the judges. You don't want to be spoon-feeding them. They don't want to be spoon-fed. As I said, some competitions might ask for a card to indicate what title you've chosen for your design. So that might be where, it's, where the class title is very broadly a song title or a movie or a period design. So you need to clarify for the judges what it is that you're actually depicting in your design. You need to ensure that the printed information is in keeping with your design style. It's not just good enough to have a little little coloured card or a little bit of white paper that you've handwritten what it is that's in your design. It has to be part of your design and you have to be careful as we'll see in a minute about where you actually place it in terms of your design. Because once it's placed beside your design it's part of your design. A minimal amount of printed information, just reinforcement of or support for your design and its execution, not an explanation of what it is or how you've done it. So here's an example now, of the title was Standing Tall, staged on a plinth 80 by 40, space allowed was a metre square, so once again I can go outside of the width of the design, I could actually cover the whole thing if I wanted to. Roses were the only flower to be used and it was judged from the front and the sides. <coughs> this particular design was part of a 14 day show with an overall theme of jungle, so I needed to incorporate the jungle theme into standing tall. This particular class that was on display for two days as part of this 14 day show also coincided with an annual Remembrance Day for returned war servicemen and women and so I wanted to incorporate that as well. So I needed to have jungle and um, Remembrance Day and standing tall. And this particular design was a case where asking others really helped me in developing the design because I couldn't think of a way to incorporate those ideas into a design with roses. So a colleague suggested to me to think about battles that have been fought in the jungle and that might be remembered on this day. And he always comes up with some really interesting interpretations of my class title. So I will take notice of what he says because I can often work my way through his suggestions and come to a design that I'm comfortable presenting on the show bench. So I chose a famous battle where Australians had stood tall amidst both the opposition and the jungle. And I printed up a small card to be placed next to the design that summarised the battle in the jungle and my interpretation of the 18 Australians who died there when they were depicted by the roses standing tall out, out of the jungle and the colour of the roses that I chose for that particular competition. So this is the, the card that was next to the design, which just as you can see, 
mentions the class title, so it's about Australians standing tall, which was the class title, a little bit about the battle, and the reason that there's 18 roses is because 18 Australians were killed in this particular battle in the jungle. So here is the design, and as you can see, the, the card is just placed slightly to the left and underneath the design. It has a base of tro tropical jungle foliage, so bamboo, ferns, lotus leaf and moss. And out of that, there are 18 long stem roses rising high above the base, standing tall. And the colours are chosen for remembrance and for love. So red and yellow roses. And the card itself is small in relation to the design size. So it doesn't overpower the design, it's simply... And, and the colours reflect the colours that are in the design itself. So let us see what the judges said. It got a first place. And the judges' comments were that it was an excellent interpretation of both the show's theme, which was the jungle theme, and the class title, Standing Tall. Well done and thank you for reminding us. Lest we forget. Another example, poetry. Now this is one where the poetry had to be named, so open slather to what you do. Bench space allowed with 60 centimetres, judged from the front, and Australian native plant material to be used. So this is one of those cases like the song title or a movie title where there are almost too many choices for you to make. So you need to choose something that is easy to depict that the judges will recognise when you've got the title there. They'll look at it and they'll say, oh yes, it's that. The challenge though is to choose poetry that can be depicted in plant material and be recognised without too much difficulty. My research uncovered an Australian poem that fitted that bill that could be simply portrayed with plant material and it's called The Man from Snowy River by Manjo Patterson. As it's a well-known Australian verse, I decided I would simply place a single card that had the name of the poem, not anything else, in my design. For something less well-known, I could have included a few lines from the poem, particularly if I was interpreting some of the lines of that poem so with the World Show in Barbados, I was privileged to present the Australian Honorary Exhibit and we used a poem as the backdrop for that design and we were depicting some of the words out of the poem and so that's why it was good to have the poem and we had it translated into a couple of languages so it was easy for other people to read the poem and then see the depiction in the, the plant material in front of that display. You'll see pictures of that in Module 2. So here is the design man from Snow River and we have a gum tree trunk as the, the base of the design, Banksia foliage twisted by the elements, the stockman's battered hat to indicate the man and some artificial snow. And the judge's comments, it came to second place and a clear simple interpretation, good work. This design could have been improved with more predominance of plant material. The hat is a focal point rather than the plant material. And you can see that yourself, you know, the, the, when you look at it, the light colour of the gum st um, stump means that the darker colour of the hat is your focal point of the design. And what I perhaps could have done is brought some more of the, the Banksia down over the hat to soften the hat or chosen a darker bit of wood as the base for the design itself. So always remember that plant material must predominate in any design and even though this design there is more plant material than anything else in the design it's the visual impact that detracted from placing in this design. So here's another one, dream time. Bench space allowed is 70 centimetres, height unrestricted, and again Australian native plant material only to be used. Now in this example I'll use a small printed card to acknowledge the cultural heritage of the story I'm dep depicting with my plant material. Because dreaming and dream time stories and dreaming stories belong to the Australian Indigenous people. And they have many stories that are collectively referred to by these terms. For this day, we're required to use Australian native flora only, which it says in the schedule. Many of the Dreamtime stories are specific to a geographic area or peoples, so I need to match, out of respect, I need to match the appropriate plant material to the story I choose. So I, can't, I, I shouldn't, in all conscience, 
use plant material that might grow in one geographic area when I'm talking about a story that belongs to a different, completely different geographic area. As bark is very important, part of Aboriginal culture, I'll use as much of this as I possibly can in the design. And the story I chose, because it's not a well-known one, I'll put a brief summary of the story on my printed card so that it helps the judges to understand the story. So there is the, the card that I used and there it is in the design. And you'll see what the judges said in a minute and when you look at it you can see what the issue is going to be or <coughs> I can anyway. <laughs> so I have acknowledged the, the dreaming ownership of the, the people who own this story, a brief summary of the story and, I, and reflecting the story I have the bark canoes that are above the, the placement of the card. I've got the brothers fishing in terms of the banksia flowers and I've got the stars created by the brothers in the small white flowers that are above the canoes. And the judge's comments got a second place. A well executed and explained story. Be careful of placement of the printed cards. This design is dominated by the white paper, not the plant material. The card could have been placed at the back of the design for a better result. So if I was going to use white and have it that big, you can see if you if you imagine that at the back of the design, it's nowhere near as dominant as it is in this placement here. So this was a, a big learning point for me and that's why I've included it here because I want you to see how much you can learn just by one simple comment from a judge about placement of a, an item like that and how different that design would be if that bit of white blob at the front was around the back. So always ensure your printed card matches your design. So even if I'd put it on buff paper, on, on, on a different coloured paper that blended in with the design, a light green, any other colour but white, and placed it at the back, it would have been a completely different looking design. So don't get too complicated. Simple is best both for the design and for the judges. Your design will be just one of many the judges consider on competition day. So the easier you make it for them, the better experience they're going to have and the better result you'll probably get. The more clearly you make your design tell the story of the class title, the easier you make the judges task. A simple design does not necessarily mean though a minimum of plant material. It just means that it is it simply exhibits the best interpretation that you can give of the class title. Your choice of design style will help with your choice of plant material. Sometimes with a design style it will even tell you in the definitions what sort of plant material would be used and this is very much the case for period designs. In all competition work plant material must predominate over any other components of your design. Try not to use embellishments. You don't want embellishments telling the story. You will lose marks if you've got too many embellishments and your plant material once again doesn't dominate the design. Look at your practice design and think about your immediate reaction. Is your immediate reaction to this design that you've put together the class title that you're trying to depict? Because if it's not it won't be for the judges either. Now here's an example where I got it completely wrong. I have to say, I don't have a photo of this. It was in my very early days where I didn't take photos of everything I did these days. I take more than one photo of absolutely everything I do. This was a mobile design. The space allowed was 1.6 metres in height, 60 centimetres in width, and it was judged all around because it's a mobile design, it should move, so they judge it all around. And I thought my interpretation was inspired because I read that as roses in outer space, or roses in space travel. So I made a mobile out of an umbrella mechanism turned upside down so I just had the wires hanging down so I could ha hang off each of those wires these little tin spaceships with roses in them. And, I, and it spun freely and I just thought it was so, so clever. But unfortunately for me, the judges were looking for a much more traditional interpretation. They were simply looking for roses suspended in the space allowed for the design. So in that space, that 1.6 metres in height and 60 centimetres in width, they just wanted to see roses suspended in that, that spatial area. 
and I had gone far too literal in my interpretation. Here's another one where I missed the point completely and this was wreathed in roses. Now it's a wall hanging and the space allowed was 80 centimetres wide, 60 centimetres in length and it was judged from the front and the sides. Now I thought and I interpreted the word wreathed as being surrounded by. Now I looked at the dictionary and I thought well, yes that's a, a nice way of doing it. The judges didn't interpret it that way and that's not what they were looking for. That were actually looking for a far more traditional interpretation so a wreath, a circular wreath made out of roses or incorporating roses. So again that was the simple interpretation and I went too complicated. I went too clever for my own good. So step two, researching the class title meaning. Let's have a look at a summary. Research the class title meaning. Use a display card if this will enhance your design and interpretation. Don't get too complicated. Simple is best, both for the design and for the judges. So, step three, choosing a design style. Let's go through the red door. Match your design style to the class title. In some schedules, the design style required will be named, and if it's not specified, look at various design styles and find some images of prize-winning examples. Choosing a design style, if you have the opportunity to do how do you do it? You select a style that will help tell the story for the judges, particularly when plant material for that style is also defined. So I think I talked earlier about a, a modern, modern art, and so you would look up the basic modern design and see if that was something where, and it is where the plant material is specified, so you, it gives you an opportunity to interpret that class title with the appropriate design style. Your initial research around class title should help with determining the appropriate design style, not just the design itself, but also the containers and vases that might be used so, so modern, Victorian, Georgian, etc. We might have a look at a few examples of those. Based on both your research and your preferred interpretation, select a design style for your competition piece. Select a secondary style for a fallback position. For example, with a class title such as elegantly tall, you might decide on a vertical design because elegantly tall gives the idea of it being vertical, but a modern design might also work in that situation. So both would have strong lines evident in the design style, but use a different amount of plant material, different sorts of containers. <clears throat> Look at the definitions of design styles from floral art associations and societies, garden clubs, horticultural societies. A lot of them now on websites with images that match so that you can get an idea of, of you can see, read the definition and then you can see how that looks in real life or in the manuals themselves that they provide. When a design style is included in the class title, you need to research both the definition and the appropriate plant material, particularly if it's a period piece because that's how it will be judged. So let's look now at some of the broad design style definitions. And in these examples, I've referenced manuals from around the world, so not just local manuals. I've, I've abridged those definitions, so these are very generic definitions. You still need to see if you can get hold of those ones that are specific to your competitions. So period designs, first of all. There's more than 15 defined period styles for floral art, and they're based on trends in a particular chronological time period, such as Art Nouveau, Baroque, uh, Rococo, Byzantine, Chinese, colonial 18th century, Dutch, Flemish, Egyptian, Georgian, Greek, Roman, Japanese, medieval, modern, Renaissance and Victorian. The floral design style is based on art and other design elements of the time of that time period. Each design style definition should also have suggestions for containers that were used at that time, the plant material that was available at that time, and these are the things that you need to include. Now sometimes the plant material won't be available to you and so it might be that you will have to interpret it as in the style of rather than in a particular style like all being um, true to the design style. So if we look at, at Egyptian for example 
the definition is that they are highly stylized flower and foliage designs and they were used for burial in tombs so they had to be long lasting ones they were used for processions and for banquet tables the religious beliefs of the time influenced the flower and foliage choices so vases held cut flowers and glass was actually produced from 2000 BC so you could use a glass container if you were doing an Egyptian period design so here's a couple of examples and so you can see how very stylized they are roses were a flower that was used at the time but they were probably the only flowers apart from lotus flowers and you can see the lotus seed pods used in the, in the second example there and if we just go back to what we talked about a few minutes ago about the period designs you can see on this this first one it's got the little card that talks about that identifies it as a, a period design Egyptian got a, a couple of little Egyptian icons there and it's actually standing on some sandstone so it lends itself to the design it works in with the design it's not just a little card that says this is an Egyptian design we look at the Greek one so the definition for Grecian designs is, is this is the classical style the simple and symmetrical form and it was a time when wreaths garlands and swags were common but very few flowers were placed in vases so if you were depicting a Grecian period design then you wouldn't use a vase because they didn't use them at the time so they used the wreaths and the swag so here's a couple of examples and, and how you can stage them again the, on the, the the second example instead of having a little card that says it's a Greek design it's been placed on a backing that depicts the column and and Greek as in the, the writing of the time so that forms part of the design and it doesn't detract from it if you had a little card in front of it you still have to have a stand that was holding it up so that's a better way of depicting it again the roses are something that was available at the time but mostly they used uh, herbs and foliage um, as part of their designs traditional designs designs that generally became popular during the 1940s and 50s at the start of the flower arranging movement so to speak and there are two distinct styles within the traditional arena and they are line and mass So these are a couple of examples. This is the pot of fleur. So in a pot of fleur, the foliage has to be living in soil of some description. And the only thing that can be cut are the flowers. So the cut flowers are placed in water retaining containers. So usually just little um, glass vases or test tubes these days, but little vials perhaps and the, the foliage is all in soil so it's all growing and the, the traditional pedestal design so this can either be a, a mass design or a, or a very formal triangular design we've got a couple of other yes so the traditional um, design examples in the line designs this is a crescent and a hogarth modern designs my favorites designs of the 20th century developed in the 60s and 70s and they are materials where they're used in a well-defined manner with depth and space vital to the design so as i said earlier it's about minimum amount of material for maximum impact and so there's two main groups in the modern design styles radial where the material apparently radiates from a single point within your container and that also coincides with the focal area and interest equated where there can be more than one point of emergence from your container or more than one in interest point in your design so we have a look at a couple of examples of those here's the basic modern so you can see that would be a radial design it all appears to come from the one point in the container all of the, the plant material and the abstract so that's interest equated because there is interest in more than one part of the design an assemblage very particular type of modern design and probably one of the few where 
the plant material doesn't have to dominate in a design and it doesn't have to be interrelated and that's one that you really need to understand the definition for because it's not used very often and it's a very interesting design style to try and get your head around when you're putting it on the bench and split level and you can see that that again uses a minimum amount of material for a maximum amount of impact. European influence design and techniques. Now, now we're starting to get a bit more into the contemporary feel of things. So these are styles and designs originating in Europe during the late 1980s and through the 1990s. And the designs are either decorative, where the plant material may be manipulated, cut or pruned, according to the designer's design. Now this is the first time that we're seeing plant material manipulated uh, and cut. It. Up to this point, it needs for the most part, some of you can do a minimal amount of manipulation in modern designs, but I wouldn't try and, and test how much the judges will allow. I think it's probably better not to do it in those designs. But now we're starting to see that you can manipulate your foliage, you can cut or prune your, your flowers and trim them around to help with your design. So they're the decorative designs and vegetative on the other side of the coin where the plant material is used in an entirely natural way. The techniques in turn that are often referred to as European techniques are the basing, binding, blocking, bunching, bundling, pillowing, sheltering, stacking, terracing and wrapping and all of those you will find definitions for across the internet. So let's have a look at some examples. This is a stacking design so obviously your plant material is stacked on t one on top of the other and this is a parve design where the design is essentially flat um, and made to look like the parve cut of gemstones so you the different facets of the the design components but you don't have any everything is placed straight down into the design Couple more. This is the, ve the, um, the vegetative side. So this is a vegetative design, as you can see. Looks natural. Looks it's placed in a natural way. So we've got the the, the fallen timber and the few rocks and pebbles, and then the, the plant material looking like it's actually growing out of that particular uh, base of, of timber. And this one is an informal parallel. So informal in the sense that the plant material at the base drapes around the container so it's parallel obviously and it's informal because it, it, it has material that doesn't follow the straight parallel lines but cuts through the base of the design there making it a little bit more informal contemporary design so these are the designs of the day and there is a lot of confusion, I will say, out there between the, of the difference between modern and contemporary designs. And that's, again, why you need to have a look at these definitions and see exactly what your particular competition area is talking about in terms of the difference between modern and contemporary. The word contemporary means of the current period. So in terms of floral art, it meant that it was freedom from specific requirements other than the elements and principles of design and it allows designers to experiment, to be innovative and to use the medium of plant material for its design qualities rather than its horticultural merits. So here are a couple of contemporary designs that we see here that this particular one, the, the netting is actually made out of twisted typha um, leaves, so bulrush leaves that have been twisted and made into rope so not obviously its natural way of being used necessarily and not certainly the way it would be used in, in a flower arrangement in traditional or modern terms where it would have just been used as the leaf to create a line in a design so here it's used in an entirely different way and here's another example where again you can see the plant material is used in all sorts of different ways and in all sorts of different angles and representations other than its natural environment Some more contemporary work here we, you see the introduction of test tubes in designs and a lot more use of fruit and vegetables and the combination of those in designs with other elements again a, a contemporary 
design this one's got some contemporary techniques it uses bleaching of seaweed and again we've got that netting made out of the typha leaves so in summary in choosing your design style choose a design style that will help you tell the story of the class title so it's one that's appropriate for the class title make sure you know the definition of the design style and stick to that because once you use a design style the judges will recognize it as a design style and you need to stick to that interpretation in terms of the design style otherwise you'll lose points for not sticking to it look at the definitions of the design styles from floral art associations from garden clubs from horticultural societies either on their websites or in manuals and look at a few different ones if, if there isn't one that is specific to your area look at a few different ones so you get a feel for what the, the generic design style would be in in that definition when a design style is included in the class title research both the definition and the appropriate plant material particularly if it's a period piece and more about that in the next step when we talk about looking at choosing your plant material so we're up to how to prepare your plant material what a lovely field that would be just to run down with your secateurs and gather up an armful So let's look at your plant material. Keep the elements and principles of design in mind when selecting your plant material, particularly in relation to the proportion, scale, rhythm and balance of your design. Make sure your plant material is what would be expected for the design style you've chosen, so the design style that we looked at in the previous step. And I can't say this often enough, check the definitions. The judges will do it so why wouldn't you you know that's the basis of what you're presenting to the judges each period if you're looking at a period design has a particular plant material that was used most of it is still available today and for example when we looked at those Egyptian ones they relied heavily on lotus on palm on papyrus and on herbs so if we look at some of those period designs. In the Grecian designs they predominantly used herbs, roses, violets, lilies and cyclamen. The Baroque period featured much larger flowers like peonies, tulips and hollyhocks. Art Deco used brightly coloured flowers to reflect the orange, purple and cobalt blue of the era in terms of the other designs that were happening around the place. Traditional designs saw the introduction of homegrown or wild flowers with an emphasis on colour harmony. So in a traditional design, you can use things that would grow in the garden. So gladioli, um, roses, dahlias, those sorts of things, those, those traditional types of flowers. But you're looking at the colour harmony when you're putting together a traditional design. Roses, lavender, gladioli, ivy, cotoneaster, chrysanthemums, dahlias, fruit in certain design styles such as still life. Modern design styles use bold, uncluttered plant material, as we saw in some of the examples, because space is an important feature of that design style. So driftwood started to be used in the modern design styles, stripped ivy, bent reeds, spray carnations, arums, lilies of other descriptions, hydrangeas, anthuriums, gerberas and orchids. All things with very definite space around the flowers. European influence and contemporary designs I've, I've put together because for the most part uh, they are interchangeable. So this is saw the introduction of twigs, branches, bamboo stems, fruit and vegetables to a much greater extent. Succulents which we are seeing very much in the contemporary work of today. Cacti, mosses, seed heads and grains, seaweed along with a multitude of floral material much more readily available regardless of your geographic location. So it's the things now that are imported in bulk to lots of countries or countries that don't have a great range of floral material can now use a lot of their dried or their leaf material rather than flowers. So it's broadened it out to plant material generally, not just flowers and not just the leaves of those for the foliage of those particular plants. Make sure your plant material is what would be expected for the design style you've chosen Keep the elements and principles of design in mind when you're selecting your plant material, particularly in relation to proportion, scale, rhythm and balance. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes' time. 
check the design style definitions that are relevant for your competition judging criteria. So again, it's going back to those rules and regulations. So now we're up to step five, how you stage your design the best way for judging. When a design's being judged from the front, that doesn't mean, as I said right at the beginning, that we should place it dead straight on the bench, flat facing, front facing to the judge. It, what it does is makes your design lose depth and dimension. So what I'm suggesting that you do is you try it at a few different angles. So start off with 45 degrees first of all to, to the front and that, and that will probably look awful but it's a starting point because you start to get an idea of how much you need to move it to get it at the best angle so that you can get the depth of the design rather than just the, the judge looking at the front of the design and not seeing anything beyond that, that front of the design. It would be like, the, the best example I can give is that if you were, you could replace your design with a screen, with a computer screen, that's what they'd be looking at. So angle it so that they can see that there's more to the design than just what they see at the front of the design and make sure that there is more to the design. A little height off the bench will allow the spa a space underneath to add further to your design. Remember that you're allocated a full amount of space and part of that air area around your design should be incorporated into the design. So if you're lifting your design just a tiny bit off the bench, it looks like it's floating. It doesn't look like it, it continues onto the bench or it's hard into the bench or the bench is part of the design. It, it gives it that independence and so the judge will, will be able to look at it independently of anything else that's around it. Sometimes it's as simple as a few coins underneath the base or a CD or a little bit of cardboard. I'm not talking about lifting it a whole lot off the bench, just a little bit. You could even try giving it an angle, such as a rock under one end, but make sure that it doesn't affect the visual or physical balance of your design. So you'll see in a minute where I've used a wedge of wood under a, a design so that it lifts it at a slight angle to face the judge better. So let's have a look at some examples. So here's one where obviously you can see the, the um, design beside me is actually front facing but it's got quite a depth to the box of the design so it, it doesn't lose any um, depth to the design because he's built a, a, a box around his particular design but mine had I had it front facing to the judge would have lost all depth because it's actually it's called picture perfect the title and this is what it looks like from the side so you get a better idea of the the angle that it was at to the front of the bench so it was about 30 degrees to the front of the bench and what it did was give the judge the opportunity to see that that my depiction of picture perfect was a reflection of so it's two designs one reflecting the other in a frame making it picture perfect so look at your design from the angles at which it will be judged and this one was obviously judged from the front and the sides so the front view is angled diagonally to the front of the bench to, to give it that depth and then the side view you can see is obviously gives it a different dimension again. From the side there's more emphasis on the reflective nature of the design and that's what I was aiming for. But what it also highlighted was that there was a balance issue with the black frame that, that isn't obvious from the front view and so I was able to fix that before judging happened, fortunately. Here's another one. So this is uh, a miniature design, so under uh, four centimeters, 10 inches, and it's a contemporary design. I've raised it slightly above the bench by taping a coin underneath that base, so you can just see a little bit of a shadow underneath it, and it looks like it's floating above the bench. The, and this is probably the best example of had I had it flat on the bench, it would have been very flat. It would have lost its its um, the lifting quality of the design because when you look at the, the base, if you looked at the base, you would have thought, oh, it just ends there and your eye would stop there. But this way, because there's space underneath it, you, you move back into the circles and you move back around the design itself. So it, it creates the, the feeling of the design floating above the bench and takes away the flatness that might be created by the design seeming to be part of the bench when it is placed, placed directly on it. So it's a hard concept for me to explain to you, but I'd like you to give it a try and to see what happens to your designs if you just lift them slightly 
off the bench or angle them slightly away from the front facing nature. Here's the Parve one that I talked about earlier. So this is one where I've actually, it's, it's viewed normally from above. So you would, the judges would look down on it on the bench. And I wanted to have a little bit more impact because of, this was a big competition and a very famous international floral person was judging it and I wanted him to be wowed by my design. So the container was actually raised on uh, the back side of it with a, a wooden wedge so that it was at an angle of about 30 degrees so that when he looked along the bench he would see mine first and be impressed with mine first uh, and then go along and do the rest of the judging. Fortunately for me, it got a first. So avoid the flat facing of your designs when you're putting them on the show bench. Lift them a little bit or angle them. Take a picture and look at it from the angles that, and take those pictures from the angles that your design will be judged so that you can see what the judge is going to see, not what you have seen in terms of your design eyes because it's a bit like when we read a sentence that's got too many words in it, we think we know what it says because we've already automatically filled in the blanks. But the camera doesn't lie, I can tell you. So take your photos, have a look at the photos, and you'll see the things that you need to adjust before judging happens. Be aware of the visual balance and of using the space around your design as part of your design. Step six, proportions of your design. Now we're starting to get into the elements and principles of design, but proportion is a particular one that we need to look at very carefully. So proportion is the relationship of components in a design and how they compare with one another. Good proportion will give your design harmony, symmetry and a balance. And that's what we want because they're all part of the, the principles and elements of design. The effective use of proportion is often referred to as harmony. And that's a relationship in which the various parts of the design appear as if they belong together in terms of size or quantity or distribution throughout the design. Remember the space recommendations about a design. You need to use or we would recommend that you use about two thirds of the space that's allocated for your design. And that what that gives you is space around your design to enhance it and to separate it from others on the bench or others on the display the staging criteria that you've got. For floor designs with unlimited height, the rule of thumb is about the same as it is for a container, one and a half times your base area. So we'd look at the height of a design being one and a half times the container or the base, regardless of whether it's on the bench or it's on the floor. So here we have a floor design it's on a base that's a meter square with a backing of two meters in height so a meter square would mean that I could probably go one and a half meters high I've actually gone a little bit higher than that and although when you look at the base and the area I've used I haven't used two-thirds of that base area but what I have used is two-thirds of the total space allocated for the design so if you imagine you draw yourself a box that is the, the base here that we see, the backing board that we see, and then wall. if I brought the walls out to the sides and the front, then I have used two thirds of that boxed area for the design. Because I've got the material at the back coming forward over the design, so it fills that space and balances it as well. Because if I had just, if I didn't have anything at the top and coming forward, then your eye would be drawn to the base of the design, it would be bottom heavy. By utilising the space of the design staging, it gives you visual as well as physical depth to this design. So here's another one. This is a second place one. And it's pretty easy to see in this that the roses in this design are not in proportion or scale to the foliage. So the foliage is very heavy and very dominant and the, the roses are too small and there's not enough of them. So either I needed to group them together so that they were a focal point or I needed a lot more of them or I needed bigger ones. So just imagine the impact of larger flowers, whether it was the larger roses or perhaps proteas because this is fairly dominant foliage so I need some really big flowers to balance it out and give it some more harmony. 
This is a petite design, so it's under 10 inches or 24 centimeters. Once again, it's important to ensure that all parts of your design are in proportion to the finished size. The trap with a petite design is to think that you need to look at smaller flowers. And that would not have worked in the overall design because the, the piece of bark is, is quite a dominant feature of this design. I needed a flower that filled or, or filled two thirds of the space that's created by that piece of bark. So smaller flowers wouldn't have worked in this particular design. Scale and proportion are always linked in a design. That's what gives you harmony. So in, in terms of summary for the proportions of your design, Proportion refers to the relative size and scale of the various elements in a design. Use a design area space to create visual depth to your design. Use two thirds of the allocated design space and your design should be one and a half times your container for visual balance. Step seven, perfect mechanics. Let's get this right. If the judges like your interpretation, your plant material, your design style, then the difference between prizes will often come down to who has done the neatest work. And that's fair enough too. Now really we should be presenting absolutely the best we possibly can. Good mechanics are vital for the physical balance and stability of a design. So you can't put in almost perfect wire and expect something to stand up. Practice before your competition day, not just about making a structure, but also placing your plant material in that structure because a structure can be nice and stable at home or in your work area. And as soon as you put the plant material in it, it overbalances or you can't get it to stay in the positions where it should be. So you really need to practice the whole design in terms of getting the mechanics right because it might need more support in some areas or you might not need any support in some areas. So you may need more anchor points, for example, or the mechanics may show more than you expect in a design. Need to ensure that all of those things have been catered for. So I always carry some moss or some pebbles or bark to fill in the gaps or to cover tubes and bases where I haven't managed to get it right in the practice or, or I've done something when I'm actually staging it that's changed the design slightly and so I need to adjust the mechanics of the design as well. So here's a design, you can see it got first place and you can see that there are mandarin slices at the edges of the glass trays. And they're actually there to cover up some paint marks that I hadn't noticed when I was practicing the design and when I put it together I had no way of removing the paint and so I had to think of some way of covering up to keep the, the design nice and neat and that was, the, the title of it was citrus glass and grass so I could actually I had actually spare mandarins on this occasion and peeled it off and put the slices down the edges of the design to cover up the paint and had them nice and neatly facing all the same way, all peeled and, and cleaned off the same way so that the mechanics of, of covering up something that was a, was a blemish meant that the design maintained its standing and actually got that first prize. Here we'll, we'll have another look at colourful creations, which we looked at right at the beginning of this module. The decorative looking wire at the base is actually holding the palm spade upright because although I had a metal rod that was to support the palm spade and, and I had tried it out at home and I put it all together at home, when I got to the, the staging area, for whatever reason, sometimes it's just nerves, I couldn't get the rod in as far as I thought it should go into the palm spade and so it wouldn't stay upright. I couldn't get it to balance with that material at the top of the spade. So I needed the extra wire to, to secure it in place, got the decorative wire, incorporated it into the design and this one actually got a second place. And the judge didn't realise that that had been adjusted there. Now here's another one we'll revisit in high spirits. And I realised almost at the end of the staging time that there was still a lot of floral foam showing in the base of the design because I, I hadn't, the flowers that I was using weren't as open as I expected them to be. And so I realised that I still had some spare of the sisal that I'd used to cover the spirals within the design. And so I shoved that all in to the base to cover up the foam. And it actually gave continuity to the design because the, that sisal then was 
was seen in the base of the design as well as in the spiral. So it, it, it helped in the end, the design itself. So let's, in summary, look at perfect mechanics. Practice to ensure your mechanics will be suitable and stable. Keep a neat and tidy finish to all wires and particularly to cable ties. Now I talk about cable ties because you should always, in, in contemporary work where we use cable ties, you need to go around and make sure you've cut off all of the, the protruding ends of the cable ties that they are all facing in the same direction. The simplest and easiest way to make a design neat when you're using cable ties is to have those ends all facing in the same direction. And that you'd be surprised at what a difference that makes to a design, but it's an easy thing to do. So, so do that if you do nothing else. Carry extra moss coconut fibre, bark and pebbles in case you need to cover your mechanics in a design. You can use offcuts. Oftentimes you, you will offcut foliage and then realise that you haven't covered your foam or, or the, the base of your design and you can cut that up into little bits and scatter that round and cover up your foam. It doesn't have to be specific things that you carry in your bag. You, you can adjust so long as you keep thinking about keeping your mechanics perfect. Step eight, the plant material condition. We're getting there. Look at that beautiful plant material. Mm -mm -mm. Judges expect all plant material to be in perfect condition. Once again, you'll lose points if there are marks or bruising or damaged foliage evident on your plant material. You'll also lose marks if you haven't cleaned off the stems properly, if you're doing that because judges will look at all of those things. It, it comes down to, oftentimes you know yourself when you look at the show bench, they're all good designs. You wouldn't want to be a judge because you wouldn't know how to differentiate them. So this is the way the slight differences become evident in designs and it's about the mechanics. It's about the plant condition of the plant material. And this is where point judging comes to the fore because the judges are going to give you actual points out of a, a total number of points for the condition of your plant material, for your mechanics, as well as all of the other things in the principles and elements of design. So keep plant cleaning cloths separate from all your other design materials so that you've got a clean cloth and you know one of those microfiber towels is probably the best thing to use that you can just wipe down your plant material. I don't recommend the use of leaf gloss or leaf shine in some competitions that you're not allowed to use it because it's embellishing your plant material, but just a, a cloth that will clean off your your, your plant material and, and learn how to transport it safely so it doesn't get bruised in transport. The other thing that I often suggest is that you keep it really hydrated so that you can see initially if there's going to be any opportunity for damage or for die off in your plant material and so you can separate it into first and seconds of, of plant material and keep them hydrated in appropriate containers so you can see here that a lot of the long stem stuff I've got up to its neck in water and other things that doesn't need a lot of water like the, the silvery gum nuts right at the front the tetragona nuts right at the front of the design of the, of the image rather um, they're in a very small amount of water just in a, a cup because they don't need a lot and I don't want the stems to discolour by being in water because I might want to use those stems. Some different ways to quickly hydrate material to minimise heat damage or travel damage. So there's lots of different ways of hydrating material quickly depending on what it is and how it takes in the water you might have to burn the stems or smash the stems or you, you it's trial and error a lot of the time there are lots of recommendations on how to do it and I find that it's better for you to know your plant material and know what works for your plant material at some of it will relate to the condition that's in when you get it and how it's been treated before you get it I don't advocate the use of plant food I've always found for me that plain water is what flowers need most in preparation for competition. Learn the ways about tidying up your plant material so the easier the best way of removing damaged petals or foliage off the stems. Watch competitors in the specimen competitions, the cut 
flower competitions and see how they prepare these perfect plant and flower specimens for their competitions and you'll see I know with the rose people that their roses travel with sponges in between the petals so if you're going for a really important competition and you've got this ideal bit of plant material that you have to use that you're desperate to use because it's really going to work for your design look at the best way of transporting that and it might be that it's got to be wrapped in cotton wool it's got to be wrapped in plastic it's got to be wrapped in a net whatever it is but look at the way that cut flower competitors prepare and transport their plant material and learn from them check that you're permitted to remove um, damaged plant material from your flowers or it might be viewed as manipulation so if you've got perhaps a dahlia and some of the back petals are dying off or curling over you, if it's in a traditional design you can't remove them so you need to find another flower to use or if you do remove them you need to hide it so that the judges can't see that you've removed them because traditional designs there's no manipulation and removing petals or removing foliage is considered manipulation Trim your plant material prior to hydration, so on the stems and placement, and again in the placement in a design. Keep off cuts in case you need more plant bulk at the base of a design, which will be hydrated, but not as hydrated as the rest of, of your plant material. Commercial plant material is not necessarily in better condition than homegrown material because you don't know how long it's been cut for or how it's been treated before it gets to you. In terms of, of homegrown material, you know how long it has been naturally hydrated before you picked it, and you can keep it that way prior to competition day much easier if you know that it's been, for example, you didn't pick it until it was fully hydrated overnight and it was six o'clock in the morning before the sun hit it, so you know it's as hydrated as it's going to be. So once you place it in the that water to keep it hydrated it's not going to need to take up a whole lot of water to, to maintain its condition. Take your time selecting commercial plant material. Don't be dazzled, you know, if you're going to market, don't be dazzled by the volume of material or that that the bunches that you get will necessarily all be perfect. You know, you might have ten roses in in your bunch. They won't all be perfect. They won't all be the best they can be. So you need to take your time in selecting the plant material because you only get one shot at using it and you don't want to waste your money on buying things that you can't use obviously all plant material should be in peak condition it should be hydrated fresh and clean learn ways to tidy your materials removing the petals and the foliage where you're permitted to do so know your supplier quality and quantity that you can get from your suppliers and commercial plant material remember is not necessarily in better condition than homegrown. So we're at the end of module one. You've made it. What have we looked at? We've looked at knowing the show schedule, staging position for judging. We've looked at class title interpretation and choice of design styles choice of plant material, the proportions of the design, perfect mechanics and plant material condition. These are the things that will help you, the eight ways that you can look at making your floral art competition design a prize winner. If you concentrate on all of those areas, you will increase your design standard and therefore move into the more obvious ways of winning a prize. Now it's time for module two and I'll walk you through all of the entries, every single entry at the World Flower Show in Barbados. Music